I spent, I, I was really happy yesterday because I learned so much and had great discussions with a number of people. And so I wanted to change a, my presentation a little bit to build upon what was said yesterday. So I won't be uh, addressing uh, the title of my original presentation that much, but I still hope it'll be interesting and hopefully you'll get something out of it too. Let me see. Okay, so briefly and as an introduction who we are, where we stand, then I'm going to talk about the economic model behind our GRT system. Then I'm going to talk about something that I'd like to call open control and then give you a brief outlook. First of all, we're a, a high-tech company in Mexico, Silicon Valley, which is the city of Guadalajara. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll be six years old as a company. Um, we really were born to improve urban mobility. So although we started out and decided that at some point in time we were going to start with uh, an application like a zoo or something like that, um, ultimately said we said that that would detract us or lead us away from our, our, our final goal and we really decided to focus then on the urban mobility solution. So what we do is we integrate, we are an, a system integrator, but we also develop the control electronics and we've had to also learn a lot about integrating a vehicle chassis. Our product is branded Autotren, which means auto and train combined. Um, and basically what we've done is uh, worked with a number of companies to put this thing together. And the interesting thing about it, also from the economic side, is that each one of these companies is investing their own money to develop their component of the system and together we hope that we will make a profit when we sell these things. <laughs> So, um, in general, we see ourselves as technology providers and working with or for, let's say then, a general contractor, usually a construction company that builds and operates public infrastructure. There are companies that do this as their business model and we see ourselves as suppliers or partners to them. Where we stand, um, we have a test facility in Guadalajara. Um, it's about 600 meters of track. It has currently three vehicles. And another uh, much smaller demo facility in another city in Mexico called Cuernavaca. Uh, that uh, facility in Cuernavaca operates only when there is a big event at the World Trade Center there, which is where this is located. Um, but really we're focusing right now on improving and expanding our test facility. So we will be adding, um, let's say if you're looking at the picture of the test facility on the right hand side of the picture, you can see a straight section of guideway. We're adding another um, branch off of that, um, which was already foreseen from the very beginning and adding an urban passenger station there. Um, when talking to potential customers in Mexico, this is also transit planners, governments, and so on and so forth, the main feedback that we got from transit planners especially, and transportation specialists, was, all right, I can believe you, technologically, we're in the year 2015, that you can achieve short headways on your main guideway but I really have trouble visualizing how you are going to process those vehicles and the passengers at the stations. Um, so the objective of this new offline station that we're building is to be really representative of a module of a station and I'm going to call, explain why it's a module because you can then put a couple of these modules in parallel where you need to and demonstrate that we can process 1,500 passengers per hour through this module continuously, okay? Or let's say for one hour or two hours in a sustained fashion. Um, I, I've explained this, I think, uh, before, but I'm going to uh, talk about it again. Um, we always refer to our system as a GRT system because in, to achieve these capacities, you're, not, you're no longer allowing people to decide whether they want to ride with somebody else or not. The system systematically and automatically groups passengers who have similar des destinations 
so that they all ride in the same vehicle, and it's not really a matter of choice. There is some choice or some limitation, for example, if you're a woman and it's 8 o'clock in the evening and you don't feel like, or you, don't, would, you would maybe not, sorry, you would maybe not feel safe riding with five other men, all right, you pick a vehicle that will be dedicated to women and children, for example, and the system will group you that way. But in general, you don't have much of a choice. You get on when the system tells you to get on. So, Returning to the economics, uh, because we come from an environment where in many Latin, Latin American cities they were not planned for so many cars, uh, the infrastructure is really completely saturated, average speeds are nowhere near 60 miles an hour, as, as in Doug's example. Average speed in many Latin American cities is around uh, 15 kilometers an hour, so that's around 10 miles an hour. Um, where what we see is that in these cities the implementation of bus rapid transit has been very successful and that's because of the economic model behind that okay these are usually public uh, public private partnerships so we've copied our model directly from the bus rapid transit model and we've adapted it a little bit to GRT but what does that really mean the way it works is the following the investment is split up among the major stakeholders okay the government is one of those stakeholders and in the case of bus rapid transit, that means that the government usually pays for resurfacing the lanes on which the buses will run and the passenger stations. Then, in the case of bus rapid transit, forget about the blue one, go to the red one. They're taking away bus concessions on those lanes. They're usually pulverized, there's lots of concessionaires and bringing them into one company and they, that company is then the owner of the vehicles, of the buses, okay? And this is the way it would be in our GRT system as well. You take away the concessions from some bus lines uh, and you bring those people on board and make them owners of the GRT vehicles. And then there's an, usually another player and that's a company that specializes in fare collection. So they do all the they equip the stations with the, with the uh, machines where you pay the fares or, um, and also go through the turnstiles and things like that and they collect the cash or whatever. And then in our case, we had to introduce a new player who is actually the operator of the GRT system. And the operator of the GRT system basically then owns the entire automation and um, will also carry all the operating costs, okay? So the way it splits down then is the government takes a certain stake, but they're only investing in the fixed infrastructure that will last for 40 years and is pretty much, or, or the idea is that it will be, to a certain extent, technology independent. Not entirely, but they don't have to worry about the exact details and, and how long a certain, what is the lifetime of a vehicle and things like that because the government shouldn't be worrying about those things. In operation then, what happens is that the fares are collected at the stations, for example at the bus rapid transit stations, all this money goes into an operations trust fund and then is divided among the stakeholders according to a predefined formula. Okay. So the operations concession get us, gets a certain amount, then the vehicle concession, then the fare collection concession, and the government gets a certain amount for its supervisory role. So the government is not trying to recoup its investment in the infrastructure through the fares. That's public investment. But of course it does need to recover part of its operating costs for supervising this whole scheme. So, so much about the, uh, the economic model. Now I'm going to talk about another aspect that we thought about when designing the control system for such a system, for, for, an, for a public transit system based on GRT. Um, most of the, uh, the systems, uh, the existing systems, ours and I believe uh, Vectus's and I'm sure that some of the other ones that are on the market also, have a hierarchical control structure. You've got some control devices that are, have a central supervisory role, usually at the central facilities. Then there are other devices, usually located on, at the stations or on, at, at the wayside. And 
other control devices in the vehicles, some of them are doing control tasks, other are doing safety or protection tasks, and they're all communicating with each other. The question is, what happens when you make a change to a vehicle that affects its control or protection devices? Okay, so you can see I've outlined here on the bottom those boxes. The change that you've made, for example, is you've gone, I'm going to use one of the examples that was mentioned yesterday, from lead acid ba batteries to lithium ion batteries. It sounds of, like a very innocent change, and yet lithium ion batteries have a battery management system, and that's talking to the control system, and you may have to modify a little bit of code in your control system software to take care of that change. And as soon as you touch the code inside a vehicle control unit, you may have to revalidate your entire control system because you don't know how that little code change is going to impact its interaction with the other control devices. That's usually how little bugs end up having unforeseen effects on the rest of the system. So we said, gee, um, imagine GRT vehicles ha get a lot of miles. Um, they're running maybe 200 miles every day or more, okay? Uh, so these vehicles are going to age pretty fast, and you heard yesterday at Morgantown how many vehicle miles travel these vehicles have. And so they've got a staff, and today, 35 or 40 years later, they're probably cannibalizing some vehicles to get parts for other vehicles, okay? So to avoid this, we said what we want to do is inside the vehicle, we're going to make a split. One set of control systems is going to be completely independent of vehicle-specific technologies, and the other set is going to be completely independent of what's outside the vehicle, and in the middle, there's a standardized interface. So what that means is you make a change to the vehicle, and you, it only affects the, the control devices on the right-hand side. And between the two, there is a communication protocol based on an open standard, for example. This is the Society of Automotive Engineers J1939 standard that we've selected. And any change that you make on the right-hand side can then be validated just on a dyno, for example. As long as that interface is validated, you can change anything on the right-hand side without touching anything on the left-hand side. And what that allows you to do, too, is you can have a device such as an emulator that's emulating everything that's happening in the physical vehicle or in physical sensors on the guideway, feed those signals into the rest of the control system, and the rest of the control system is completely independent of those hardware-specific things. So, with this, you can see uh, here in this picture, those boxes there are the boxes that are physically going to be mounted on the guideway or in the vehicles, and it can all be tested in a rack ahead of time, and when you're ready to actually implement it in the physical implementation, you just take those exact same devices, put them in the cars or on the guideway, and it should run exactly the same way as it did in the rack. So my outlook is, um, we're dealing with here a system that requires additional infrastructure. It uh, requires significant investment. And for that to be worth it, it's got to have a certain capacity and it's got to have a certain speed. That's the way at least our customers see it. So we see the placement of our technology, and I deliberately called it pod rapid transit, to make uh, no distinction whether it's personal or group. It's just a concept. We're using small vehicles to carry a lot of people, and that to me is pod rapid transit. And this is where I would place it on a transit planner's map. High speed and medium capacity. And I think that that's where the industry should be going. Thank you very much.